week for practice for uh, for for composite, you know, chair side, and then the week after will be the exam for composite and cements and sealants, and we'll see how that will work. Okay, let's start sharing in a minute. Let's start that. The recording is started. So our lecture today, if it wants to open, our lecture today is about dental amalgam. So we know the filling materials that we have in dentistry technically are two in a way, right? We have direct filling materials, which are composites and amalgams. And, they are, and then we know amalgams are the older, the first type of actual filling materials. They used to have also gold filling materials where they can put them, but that went away. And then we have amalgams and it's kind of going away, you know, but still done in some, um, in some instance where uh, the dentist would prefer to fill it or sometimes the patient cannot pay for a crown and uh, an amalgam can do the job because it can, it can help fill uh, a big part of the tooth. But again, composites are just getting there. You know, there's a lot of improvements with composites and uh, a lot of clinics are completely what they call them mercury free. So they don't have any amalgam in their clinic, right? completely off. They don't have any of that. But anyway, again, it's still there. It's still a procedure that is done. And it's, uh, it's important to know um, what are the parts and things that are related to dental amalgam. I think, again, as usual, we sh Oh, I did not even share my screen. That's good here. Uh, I think uh, we should watch definitely a video for amalgam before I start talking about anything. Uh, some of you are might be familiar with again with amalgam you might have some of you might have an amalgam filling uh, and um, or at least family member that have a, an amalgam film so let's take a look at the videos that we have um three videos and i think we're going to play all of them but parts of each just to get through the So this is a good informative video about kind of the setup a little bit. Hi everyone, this video will show you an amalgam procedure from the perspective of the dental assistant. We have our amalgam tray already set up and the tooth has been prepared. We will be working on tooth number 19, the class two restoration, MO preparation. Our instruments are set up in order. We already have a matrix band on the tooth. We have our amalgam capsules here, and given the doctor's signal, we are ready to mix. So amalgam used to come, well, now comes in amalgam capsules, which are similar to the capsules that now we're mixing for cements. Uh, but it used to be actually where you actually pour, you know, amalgam is mainly mercury and other material with it, right? It's a mercury, which is a metal that actually comes in a fluid type. It used to be like you have to pour amount of mercury and the amount of the other silver and tin components and copper component, and then you put it together and mix it. And that's actually how when we were uh, when I was a student in the school, uh, they have a big machine that mixes it for us because we use a lot of amalgam. So they actually, you know, they click it and they call a spill click, click, click. And, you know, we can decide how much amalgam we want. Anyway, nowadays they all come in these. Uh, capsules and we put them in this device which is called amalgamator exactly or triturator if we want to have it more general word so you'll see the types of of capsules that we have for amalgam the different capsules we have a capsule that needs to be activated you would push the plunger in until it's pressed in all the way and we also have self-activated capsules that when they're placed in the triturator or the amalgamator, they mix automatically without us having to squeeze or activate the capsule. I'll activate this one. 
squeeze it together. You can either squeeze it in your hands or press it on the countertop. Activating it will allow the mercury liquid and the powdered alloy made of silver, tin, copper, and zinc to mix in the refrigerator. Lift the lid up. And you can see, I mean, this is a different type of triturator than what we have, but. For the rotomix, you just turn it and then release, and it will squeeze the capsule inside the ends there. Close your lid. Make sure you've selected the proper time for your type of amalgam, and press start. So definitely, again, just follow the manufacturer instructions about how long you need to triturate it, depending on the device that you have. When it's finished, lift your lid and remove your capsule. To open your capsule, twist and pull and let the amalgam fall into your well. Or if you're using a squeeze cloth, let it fall onto your squeeze cloth. So this is amalgam well, and technically it's just a metal thing that we use. Uh, to collect the amalgam and take the amalgam from. Take your carrier. Right. You guys know the instruments, so that's a good thing. And this is how we use and the carrier. Use the I'm not sure if Ms. Shook showed you. Do, do you see? So this is how you use the carrier. Technically, you push it into the amalgam. Your carrier. I like to hold the well firmly in one hand as I press the carrier into the mix with the other. If you're using a double-ended carrier, make sure you fill both ends. I thought they were different sizes. They are. Usually we start with a bigger one and then, you know, put in and place it. And then as, I'm sorry, we start with a smaller one because we need to reach down with the other way. I think the bigger one first because, no, the smaller one first because we have to reach down. I'm thinking, you know, you have to reach down and then you place it, you condense it, and then you fill it up and fill it up until you get to the top. But again, it depends if the dentist Once maybe prefer both. The carrier, we deliver it to the dentist. Before I do that, I want to show you what these look like. So we pack the amalgam into the carrier. When the doctor dispenses it into the preparation, they get a nice solid cylinder of amalgam that they can then pack in to the preparation. So the goal for the assistant is to pack this firmly enough that you get nice solid cylinders. Crumbly mixes will just fall out. So when you hold these carriers upside down, your amalgam mix should not fall out. I'll just reload this quickly. You have a limited time to work with your amalgam. This is a fast set amalgam. When you deliver your carrier, deliver it in the direction of use. So if we're working on a mandibular tooth, which we are, face your carrier downwards. And if it's double-ended, deliver the small end to the doctor. Of course, I don't have a doctor here, but this does just fine to represent what the doctor does. They hold their hand out and we deliver. Return to your tray. The doctor will need the condenser next. Once the filling is in the prep, they have to pack it. Again, deliver the small end first, unless your doctor specifies otherwise. Stick out your pinky to retrieve the used instrument and deliver the new instrument firmly into their hand. And so on. So we go through the process and I'll show you the next video. I mean, this goes, but I think now she's mixing the other type of that way the old mix does not interfere amalgam. So she's mixing another capsule. If you combine them, put it into your refrigerator. Shake. Pretty big part with the past past day once so we're ready to Oh yeah, just see that this uh well. This type of capsule have a, a plastic part in it that helps in the mixing. With this one, we have some pieces inside. What does the mixing is this pestle, and you may find a diaphragm, a plastic 
piece that separates the mercury from the powder in the capsule until we're ready to mix. Mm -hmm. Take those out, and then you can load our amount. So you condense it and you give it, and then after the condenser, we're going to traditional method what my original dentist used carver and so on and so forth. So let's see the actual procedure here that will help better. Your actual carving instruments, these are similar to your waxing instrument, they are slightly different. Is facing towards the gingiva. So that the top, it's easiest to use one spill at a time, one spill at one capsule. So you use the back end of your meat handle to dispense it into the dappen dish and proceed to use your carrier. Some use the dappen dish because it's disposable instead of using the amalgam jar. Your carrier. Make sure to fill your preparation section by section and not just drown the whole entire thing in amalgam. It's really easy to do that and make sure you condense in multiple directions, which involves using both lateral forces and horizontal forces with your amalgam. Make sure to always use the small end of the condenser first. So amalgam carrier, then to carry the amalgam in, condenser to condense it. It's important to have your dismiss width at a minimum of one millimeter. Make sure and we keep going back and forth. And make sure to seal the edges of your box by pushing. It's not going to seal on its own, especially as you realize it is very sandy material once it starts setting up. Make sure to condense each individual portion before moving on to the next increment. It's important that you also do not start carving prior to condensing adequately because it's very common for an amalgam to kind of flake off when it's still in its most liquid state. So condensing. We usually overfill the tooth so that we can actually create the anatomy. Yeah, like you, you put more amalgam than it needs so that you can actually carve it, right? I mean, when you fill your Yeah, the clear discoid and the other one, the Hollenbach carver. Yeah, so now they're just condensing. I'm not sure. Is, did he start? Yeah, see, he's starting to carve. You can also get rid of the excess either with surgical suction or you can push it off the preparation with the pump. Just make sure you get rid of it some later. At this stage, you can start out by carving and getting rid of the bulk excess either using an acorn burnisher or a tea ball burnisher. The idea here is not to use pressure to ditch your preparation, but simply to get rid of some of the bulk excess, going up those grooves, as well as going through what will be your central bridge in the future. So you uh, go around between the carvers and the burnishers as well. The burnishers can define more of these anatomy landmarks and it also smooths out the edges of the filling afterwards if you want to be careful you can always keep it short of the central groove and redefine your central groove and it's really important you can also define this to include all these secondary accessories. Oh, let's see. He's going to remove the the top of wire. When you're working on your pitch, you want to make sure you don't have your instrument at too steep of an angle, making sure, again, you're half on to half on yourself. So, your anatomy does not need to be so defined as to include all the And that's a really, you know, important step because when you remove the top of wire, you have to Remove it slowly from the side because otherwise you might break this and then you have to redo it again. Yeah, that was just uh, a lot of, <laughs> you know. Yeah, like you have to do that and then if you didn't condense it well, even if you condense it well, sometimes it's too big. You try to remove it and then it breaks down and then you have to redo all of that work. Yeah. But we're more looking for having your buckle groove, navel groove, 
I think he did his Stoffelmeyer from the front, which not right. I mean, it should be to the side. See how we hold it here again. This is all just to and so on i want to show you this because this takes it you know they clean it up a little bit more <laughs> So they're doing the preparation here. Now they're placing and going to condense. <laughs> Is it? Condensing. Did I skip? They're doing the burnishing. This is a football burnisher, right? Yeah. You can see it defines the anatomy. It takes a little bit of the extra and it smooths the edges. That's one of the main things. Smooths the edges of the filling to the tooth. Carving. Like a discoid. And they make it look nice. A lot of carving, a lot of work, and then it sets definitely the the particles, the extra particles we have to place it uh, separately is considered as a biohazard, as we'll talk about. And then we can even use some bursi. After 24 hours, we can do the finishing of the uh, and polishing of the amalgam. And you'll see it will look much more shiny than it was at the beginning. So they use these brownie, uh, brownies and um, greenies to do the smoothing and polishing of that amalgam. They might, exactly. And uh, with time, it does. Exactly. See now? It looks really nice and shiny and all of that. You're doing, you know, yeah, the vacuum, yes. And then you have to open up that, you know, container that we have in the vacuum, the filter, and then you have to drop it in the, sh in the biohazard. Yeah, you cannot, uh, yeah, because it's still amalgam. Yeah, we cannot just throw it in the, yeah, it has to be. So finally, we're back to the lecture. <laughs> um, that was amalgam again so we'll just talk about the different things of it um one of the strongest of the direct restorative materials so again when you compare to uh composite it's still it's really strong but composite is going there or getting there it has good durability low cost and live expenses exp expectancy off about uh, 15. <laughs> Bertha got that. <laughs> so it's about 15 years. That's technically like, again, it doesn't have to be, but that's generally known for amalgam. About 15 years. I mean, composite, they used to say it's about 10 years. Composite. But now again, composite getting better, the way that they do, do it, the bonding systems and everything, all that. So amalgam is an alloy. An alloy means a mixture. Yep, exactly, right? <laughs> It's a mixture of two or more metals. 
So generally the materials or the metals that we have into amalgam are <laughs> yes. So copper, tin, and silver are the main material miss uh, a material uh, what do I call these metals. <laughs> And definitely mercury here, right? They are mixed with mercury afterwards. And again, it depends. Some of the of amalgams are copper, uh, you know, have more copper than silver. Some of them have more silver than copper and all of that. It depends on the dentist's choice and preference. So the amalgamation is the process when we mix the these uh, metals with mercury. That is called amalgamation. Okay, and technically, I think amalgam is mean put together. So, like the word itself, that's what it that what it does mean. Uh, and that's as you saw. I mean, this is how it comes. You have powder, and you have that liquid, which is mercury, technically, and it get mixed in in the uh, amalgamator in the capsule. And that's why I mean, definitely, we do not want to open any of these capsules before mixing it, because that mercury can come out, and mercury, you know, it's a toxic material. So, if we want to look deeper into the uh, amalgam alloy particles, what is it made of? So, uh, there are differences between the shapes and how they make. Again, as I said, there are different types of amalgams. So, depending on the particles that they have, how they cut them, it can be an irregular cut. It can be a spherical cut, which is technically like bowls or, uh, yeah, technically like bowls. And then we have admix, which is... Uh, irregular and regular. So if you look here on this side, this is like an electronic microscope picture. This is the irregular cuts of the metals inside of amalgam. And these are if they cut them as spherical. So which one do you think set faster? The spherical, right? Because um, they can be surrounded by much more mercury than the irregular one. And that why, that's why we need less mercury when we have a spherical type of particles in the amalgam. Uh, let's see. We said we have silver, tin, copper, and palladium. They can add zinc. And zinc, adding zinc would inhibit corrosion or may, and also would help, well, will cause gradual expansion of amalgam, which we'll see. So these are things that can happen to amalgam, corrosion, and gradual expansion. Uh, that we have to deal with. And uh, so we add zinc. It can help with that, but it can also cause sometimes the expansion of the amalgam. So uh, that's the amalgamation, how it transforms when we start the mixing. Uh, again, it's a chemical reaction. These particles would dissolve in mercury and it will be a putty-like consistency to work with. Shaw. Print phases as it's actually start to get firm and we can work with it. The first part of the firming. So once we mix it, the amalgam can be, once we mix it, we can carve it, right? So that's the first part where we can carve the amalgam. The second part is the initial set where it's no longer can be carved. So technically, you know, it takes you about 10 minutes or about minutes for amalgam to set on your hand. So that's another problem with amalgam. But you have a set working time compared to composite. You put composite with it and then when you want to set it, you just cure it. And then complete set will happen in 24 hours exactly. And you can see here within the first hour it reaches 50% of its strength or if it's set or firming, but then within the 24 hours, it will reach its complete set. So it's within the first hour. All good, right? We have three conditions that we're talking about here. Corrosion, galvanism, and tarnish. So which one do you think, guys, is which? Wow. <laughs> Anyone else? Okay, 
Here we go. Go, Kara. Okay. <laughs> Galvanism, garnish, and corrosion. Well, that's a smart way to do it. Yeah, right. <laughs> Okay, so these are the things that can happen to amalgam generally. Uh, we have a few other things that we'll talk about here. But tarnish is technically oxidation. That's what you were talking about, Slali, right? Yeah. So it, it will make the amalgam dark or dull appearance, but it is not very destructive. So it's not a destructive, so it's not like bad for the integrity of the filling. The filling still is okay. The margins are good. It's just the color changed, right? If we have a rough surface, we'll have more tarnish. That's why we want to, yes, polish amalgam to reduce the tarnish. So that's, huh? <laughs> well, I think you do because, I mean, you need a lot of quick speed. You need water comes with it. I don't know if there is any, there are any products that are in the market to do that. I mean, you might do your own research, but as far as I know, no. <laughs> right. I don't know. I mean, you might see, you know, I, I don't know how much you would charge. Maybe they would just, if you go to your dentist for a regular visit, they might do it for you for free. Well, <laughs> and the lab? I don't think so. <laughs> I have one of my friends did their filling on themselves. Yeah. But he's he's a master of doing things, you know. He's he's great. He was just natural dentist. You know, his hand is super great with you know, he's very uh artistic. He does the filling. Yeah. He did he did his own. Yeah, and I think what happened was a filling fail, and he kind of just corrected it a little bit, but then he did the filling. Like, afterwards, I don't think he did the cutting all of it because it's hard. But there is a dentist online, like, where he did his own extraction. I think you can find a video. Yeah, and the same thing on filling. I remember he didn't tell anyone. He only told me, so. <laughs> yeah, well, you don't know him unless I bring a picture of him. He's not here. <laughs> Anyway, but uh, so we'll, we'll see. So corrosion, on the other hand, is will weaken the amalgam. It can surrounding uh, Them, right, it can deteriorate the margins. If you look at amalgam, right, this can cause micro leakage and this type of amalgams we have to replace and either put. or what used to happen was people amalgam an arch and the approach is a gold crown for example because these are different methods that have electrons and you know, when you buy one there will be some kind of connection and you might feel uh, an electrical you know zing in your in your mouth yeah. yes having two different types of filling materials. So this used to be how I don't think it happens that
to happen. So you have uh, an electrical a little bit, and then paste. Other changes to amalgam, what we call creep, and also delayed expansion. So creep is change in, yo, do you have the original file or what? <laughs> huh? So these things can happen to amalgam. Um, some of that, like sometimes creep is, is a little bit good because it kind of fills out, you know, it, under the pressure of the other. Creep happens because under the pressure of the other, uh, of the other tooth on top of it. So it kind of, it, it, occlusion. Um, Uh, expansion and contracts, any metal can expand and contract. So we said that this is a problem with all fillings. Technically, any contraction can cause. Okay. <laughs> and expansion can cause. Failure. What do you think? I didn't do anything. <laughs> it's in the lecture, so it's true. Huh. Fracture, right? Expansion can cause fracture because it expands. Right? Contraction can cause micro leakage. <laughs> so, thermal conductivity, it is a good thermal con conductive material because it's metal right for deep cavities we have to use yes alex thank you bright side and or yes oh okay alex that's it you get 100 for the next exam <laughs> just playing favors here yeah <laughs> So you can see, I mean, we saw this before when we were talking about bases and liners. You have a deep filling that is close to the pulp, especially with with amalgams, because they're metal and they can conduct the heat right away. Uh, so we usually need a base. So, and then we put amalgams. Almost amalgams are not placed without a base, okay? And we can also use liners and this will prevent uh, some thermal and mechanical uh, work. Manipulation of amalgam, we use a triturator or, okay, what is that? <laughs> right, the amalgamator. <laughs> so that's the machine that uh, is used to mix. What happened if we under over uh, triturate? So if we under, it will be dry because technically the liquid, which is, the silver liquid, right, would not be mixed completely with the with the amalgam, so it will be dry. If we over mix it too much time mixing, it will be too wet. And then if it probably uh, properly mixed, we know what happens. If you look at this picture here, this is technically the powder and the liquid. This is under triturated. This is over triturated. You can see this is dry. This is uh, more liquidy, and this is the properly triturated one. So if we look here, uh, the capsule, no, 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 yeah. The capsules, they come in different sizes or they call them spills. So how much, you know, one of, there are two, one, two or three spills. So when we buy these capsules, we can buy them and, and it's just the amount of amalgam. So for example, if you're doing like an MOD, you might need a three spill capsule, right? Instead of having just one. Oh, just like the size. Amount, the amount of amalgam. The amount of amalgam inside of the capsule, that's the spill. So 
You can't have a one or two or three again. Or, you know, a lot of times we mix like multiple capsules. We don't, don't mix only one. So mix a capsule, we mix the other one. That's the thing. You have to mix it before the other amalgam is dry because if the other amalgam sets, then it will not link to, to each other, right? So uh, we have to take that in consideration as well. Um, these are technically the steps place. So after we mix it, we place it in the amalgam. Well, yes. Who is that? Huh? Someone here? And then we went out with the amalgam carrier. Exactly. And then we want to... <laughs> what do you think, Olivia? Because you asked me about that. No? Yes, Samantha. Go right side. <laughs> yeah, it looks like everyone is. Sam, I guess these lights are going to turn on the lights from now on. <laughs> so overfill the cavity to allow carving. Then you condense with a condenser to fit all the areas properly. And then you burnish so that you would seal the margins and enhance the longevity. And then carving would remove the extra. And then we want to wait for 24 hours before we do the polishing and finishing so that we would allow the amalgam to completely crystallize and completely set before we do that. And we know that polishing would uh, help with reducing the tarnish. <laughs> Unlikely. <laughs> you say, how, how likely would the dentist ask the patient to come back in 24 hours? Yeah, honestly, I mean, I haven't seen a lot of amalgam done anyway. You know, there, it's not done as as often anymore you would see it i don't know again there are a lot of clinics that are amalgam free amalgams yeah technically this setup i mean we have most of the instruments here right some hand cutting instruments so i think this is like a it looks like a black spoon right from what i can see Cannot see what this is. Huh? more bad. It's because it's it has mercury in it. It sets it on its own, right? So these are all things that will make it a little bit bad. But the most bad part of it, I would say, is that it used to be, you know, again, when it was used, when it's the only option technically, or not the only, you know, the best option there, even if the cavity was only here. So for example, if I want to redraw this, let's say we only had a cavity that just goes there, right? That's, that's only the cavity that we have. What we needed to do with amalgam is we needed to do all of this around it to be able to do to put amalgam in right so we have to do all of this expansion of the of the cavity because amalgam sets and retention the retention of amalgam is mechanical there we're not putting any you know glue to put it in place 
It's just like putting something and when it's said, it gets stuck in there. That's it, right? You put something in a place and it just gets stuck because the way that you make these, the cavity preparation. So again, you know, that's how it was. We, with, with uh, composite, for example, if we have a filling, if we have a cavity that is this, we just put it in there and then we fill it with composite and that's it. That's the end of the story. We don't have to expansion. We don't have to do any of that. But again, with amalgam, we have to have a certain depth and we have to have that convergence, right, of, of the uh, cavity and the big part of it so that we can actually hold the composite in, I mean the amalgam in, and it will not come out of the uh, cavity. So that's a problem. We're destroying uh, an active and healthy tooth part just so that we can put amalgam in place. Okay. And again, you had, you know, we had to do this at a certain angle. These needs to be rounded. So it was a lot. And that's why we used to have these cutting instruments like the, the hatchets and the, what do you call these other ones? Chisels, right? Because you have a lot of angles that you have to try to make better. Again, for the tooth not to crack. Because if you make this, if you make this a sharp angle like that, it can crack. It can actually produce a crack of the tooth, you know, fracture of the tooth. So they have to make it round and all of that. So again, that's why composite is much easier. You just go in and fill it in. You have bond and will help you with uh, gluing the composite to the tooth. So that's how it was. So this is what mechanical, yes, retention. We're using undercuts. That's what we call these undercuts. Technically uh, making uh, an area that getting the amalgam to be stuck in and it's not bonded to the tooth. Recently, there's this wet resin technique that came in. So that's a new method. So we use retention with resin bond, right? So the same bond that we use uh, with composite. You do etch, you do bond, and this was found to reduce micro leakage a little bit. But again, amalgam is not here to stay. It's going away already, and um, it is what it is. We're good, yes. So they tried to make a mercury-free amalgam and tried to do that with a different type of metal, but then they found out it's not good because we have high corrosion that occurs. So they didn't do it. <laughs> it's just few information. Did it work? No, it didn't. What did they use? Galadium. It's similar to amalgam, but it didn't work. It has high corrosion. Um, Mercury is toxic metal, definitely, and that's why people uh, were against it and some still against it, right? And that's why we have mercury-free dentistry. Um, but they found out that there is no real uh, problem with amalgam, so they found that it's minimal. The studies shown that the mercury release from our work is minimal. It's not affecting anyone, uh, and there's no substantial research that found otherwise. Anyway, when we work with amalgam, we have to be cautious. So we have to be working with safety. We have to think about our patient, ourselves, and the environment, because again, we don't want to expose the patient to a lot of uh, these mercury fumes. Uh, our staff, we want to make sure that we're mixing it correctly, not getting anyone exposed to mercury spills. Uh, and then the environment so that we do not um, dispose of amalgam or we dispose of amalgam the correct way by placing it in a special bin and then uh, we send it to a collector that would collect it. So um, some even not like dental assistants and dentists would get exposed to like the office staff can get exposure to mercury as well and these are some things that can happen if you know when we place or remove it, if we have leaking amalgam capsules, uh, some mercury droplets, sterilizing instrument with, and so on and so forth. So these are the problems that can happen that might uh, cause exposure to, amal to mercury. 
to minimize it, our civilization room must be must have etiquette. Yep, ventilation. Operatory floor surfaces must be, huh? How did you know that? How? It's something. How did you know that? Do you want? Huh? Non-porous, yes. We have to wear our PPE and we have to use water. Scrab amalgam should never be thrown in the trash can. And yeah, well, we we can have a special container just to, but we have containers like these in the lab actually with all the amalgam scraps in it. When we are going to do amalgam, I think Ms. Jukes is going to introduce, introduce, introduce. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm going to put back on her. <laughs> we'll see. I don't know. I'm focusing on composite much more. We'll see. We'll see after composite. We can do some uh, amalgam with some of you, maybe at least just to show it. Um, just so that, I mean, you guys get exposed to that again. It's not a, it's not for me, it's not uh, as much importance as 